Hunter, as an art critic and as an art journalist, for years you've written about the arts and artists, architects and architecture, design and designers for newspapers and magazines, and now a book. You also did a television series on the arts. Is one medium more interesting to you than another? Well, certainly writing a book is the most difficult thing to do. And, uh, and I think it probably is the most rewarding I, I, because I know, it'll, I hope, I hope it'll be around for a while. Uh, with this book on Georgia O'Keeffe, I set out years and years ago to answer a lot of questions that I felt hadn't been answered. And it just took a long time to get, uh, get those answers. But I think that of all those media, certainly it, it's rewarding because I feel like I did what I set out to do. It's, it's incredible. And that actually was a question I was going to ask. What drove you to spend over 12 years researching and writing that very large, extraordinary book? Was it because it had never been done? You admired her greatly or a combination of both? And you just said there were many questions unanswered. Well, it began back in 1987 when she died, and I wrote an obituary for Art News magazine. And in doing the research for that piece, I found that there was no big book on Georgia O'Keeffe. There was a small biography, and there were lots of magazine articles. But people tend to write about Georgia O'Keeffe then and now in a very uh, appreciative and enthusiastic way, which is fine. But it didn't feel like what had been written was getting at the meat of some of the of the, some of, of, of what made her Georgia O'Keeffe. So I started out on this project and it took all this time to, answer, to, to get to the meat, really. Uh, Georgia spent a lot of her time covering up her past and making it difficult for researchers and critics to um, understand where she'd come from. Why would she do that? Well, I think being with Alfred Stieglitz, her husband, she learned the importance of being a professional artist. She learned the skill of presentation, and she learned to present herself as this kind of iconic image from him, uh, to dress in a certain way, to always be a certain kind of person when she was being Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist. Uh, meanwhile, if she was, happened to be at home, she'd probably let her hair down and cook and, and be a natural, fun-loving kind of girl. But when she was out in public, she was very grand and, um, and eccentric and uh, demanding Georgia O'Keeffe because she knew that the public expects their artists to be uh, something different from a mere human being. They expect them to be grander and more difficult. They expect them to have, wear funny clothes and, and have odd lifestyle choices. And uh, she accommodated that perception. The main character in my book, who brings a whole new dimension to the relationship of Georgia O'Keeffe, Alfred Stieglitz, and her life after Alfred Stieglitz, is, of course, Dorothy Norman, who was in her 80s when I interviewed her and who decided to go public with her relationship with Alfred Stieglitz. It had been rumored for years that Dorothy Norman had been Alfred Stieglitz's lover, but it, it had been equally rumored that they were just friends, and no one really knew what this relationship was. She told me about their love affair and how often they made love and how satisfying it was, and she also uh, let me read her correspondence with Alfred Stieglitz, which uh, it's, went from sort of the late 20s until, you know, the 40s, when he, di he died in 1946. And I think I'm the only biographer to have read this correspondence. And what happened is that it, it made it clear to me, that correspondence made clear to me, that that relationship was much more profound and long-lasting uh, than anyone had previously suspected. That really, uh, even though we always think of George O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz as the, as the, 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 the most passionate, loving couple of, of their period in the 1920s. Uh, in fact, their relationship is only about 10 years long before he decides to have an affair with a much younger Dorothy Norman. And I really thought that had a tremendous effect on George O'Keefe, on the fact that she'd had this nervous breakdown and that she moves to New Mexico 
I, I think that those, those come after his, the discovery of, his, of Stieglitz having the affair, and I really felt that that was really tremendously interesting and important information that hadn't been in any previous book. Stieglitz and O'Keefe stay together. They never divorce. They are still married when he dies in 1946. But at the same time, Alfred Stieglitz has a relationship with Dorothy Norman from sort of 1928 to 1946. I mean, it goes on. And more devastating for, to George O'Keefe, I think, than the fact that they were just having sex was the fact that he made her the director of his gallery, an American place. He put her in charge of the rent fund. He let her sell art. He helped her. He taught her to be a photographer. Uh, he published books with her. She became kind of his helpmate and his partner in a way that George O'Keefe did not because George was busy being a painter. And uh, what, 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 what really happens, uh, just to jump ahead a bit, is, is, is that, or to jump back, is that you know, Alfred Stieglitz discovers the young unknown Georgia O'Keeffe and he makes her into the most famous woman artist ever to exhibit in America and even in Europe. Uh, at the height of this, this career surge around 1927, uh, she's no longer the devoted, malleable, and, uh, and naive woman she was when he met her. And so she's no longer his student. She's become an independent painter in her own right. And at that point, he is threatened by the fact that he is no longer uh, the guiding force in her existence, and he's no longer the big mentor. So he turns his attention to another student, the 21-year-old Dorothy Norman, who knows nothing about art and who is willing to sit at his feet and listen to all of his stories again and take notes and, and, and compile them all and into, into books and journals. And, and who's absolutely devoted to him. Uh, and so it's a, it's a classic story of, you know, of a powerful man feeling threatened by his woman, his wife, when she becomes his equal. However, uh, I don't think many people know that this story happened to Georgia O'Keeffe and that she was felt, of course, betrayed by his um, love for another woman, but she felt equally betrayed by the fact that, that the woman never went away. She stayed there. She ran the gallery. All their friends knew about it. It was extremely embarrassing, and uh, no one knows this. So Georgia knew of this affair for all of these years. Is that true? Yes. Wow. Georgia found out she, that uh, at first she found out that Dorothy Norman was hanging about the gallery. And then eventually she figured out that they were having sex, even though Alfred Stieglitz denied this to her. Dorothy Norman, by the way, was married to an extremely wealthy investor named Edward Norman. Uh, at this whole period Throughout of time? Throughout this whole period. In fact, she was pregnant with their first child when she first went to Alfred Stieglitz's gallery. And she, they both had this kind of elaborate... Um, kind of denial that what they were doing in having this love affair with one another was actually beneficial to the states of their marriages, that it would keep them fresh and available for these partners of theirs. So like a lot of people who are having affairs, they developed a kind of rationale around it. So from 1928-29, you know, I think, I think O'Keefe kept hoping it would just go away. Uh, in 1929, things are bad enough that she decides to go to New Mexico, Taos, New Mexico, for the first time with Beck Strand, the wife of Paul Strand. Uh, they go to stay with Mabel Dodge Lujan. Uh, she is reintroduced to the Southwest, where she had also, she, you know, previously she'd been teaching in Canyon, Texas, which she just loved. She loved the forms of the Southwest, she loved the colors, she loved the light. And so she was felt immediately revived by this trip. And I think it felt, she felt that her absence from Alfred over the summer for three months would somehow um, wake him up, you know, make him feel like, like, wow, what if she leaves me? But instead, what it did is it actually gave, uh, he wrote these hysterical letters to, to Georgia begging her to come back and telling her how much he missed her, but at the same time, he wrote many, many letters of passion and affection to Dorothy Norman, and he saw her, and he actually continued his affair and even deepened his commitment to the affair while she was gone. So when she came back, she hoped everything would be back to normal, but in fact, uh, it was not. It was just that 
Stieglitz kept trying to bury the evidence of this affair, but that he couldn't do that since you know Dorothy was in the gallery and Dorothy was seeing their friends. What was the relationship between Georgia and Paul Strand? You mentioned Paul's wife that was with her in Taos. Well, that was another interesting revelation from uh, my research. I spent a lot of time simply reading the correspondence between Georgia O'Keeffe and, and many people and at the Beinecke Library at Yale University, and I also read correspondence at the Center for Creative Photography at the University of Arizona in Tucson and many other places. But by reading these letters, just spending a lot of time reading their correspondence, I felt like I got the most accurate picture of what really happened in, in the time that, that, they, that we're talking about. And in reading that correspondence between Paul Strand and Georgia O'Keeffe, it became clear to me that she was crazy about Paul Strand way before she got together with Stieglitz. Now, she was already being exhibited by Alfred Stieglitz in 1916 and 1917. And she comes to see one of her shows at the gallery, the 291 Gallery on Fifth Avenue. And it's the spring of 1917. And while she's there, Stieglitz introduces her to this handsome young photographer who also shows at 291, and that was Paul Strand. And immediately, these two people are completely smitten with one another. She has to go back to Texas to teach. And she starts to write Paul Strand the most extraordinarily passionate love letters. And in exchange, he sends to her many, many photographs. Uh, the ones he was doing then were done for, from 1916. They were highly abstract. And he used techniques of enlargement and cropping to just really focus on the forms in these black and white photographs. And these were very much influential on O'Keeffe's decision in her early watercolors to abstract simple forms in space. And what I found is that actually Strand is the big influence on Georgia O'Keeffe's work at the beginning, uh, not Stieglitz, as many people have said. Uh, and also that's partly, I think, because she was so infatuated with him. Well, the funny part of this story, of course, is that uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but of course, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, you know, O'Keeffe really saw him as a mentor. He was 24 years older than she was. He'd been married for 25 years to Emmy. He had a 20-year-old daughter. So she didn't see him as a love interest. She saw Paul Strand as someone who was her own age, more or less, and had uh, more in common with him. In 1918, she becomes very ill with influenza, the same influenza that kills millions of people that year. Uh, and in the winter of 1918, it's brutally cold, and she's in San Antonio, Texas, trying to recover. And Stieglitz sends Paul Strand to see if she'll come back to New York to be healed and recover there. And when he gets to there, she's so happy to see him because she thinks he's come to pursue a relationship with her. And in fact, he himself is on a bit of a fact-finding mission. Can he have a relationship with Georgia O'Keeffe, this woman who's been writing him all these very passionate letters? However, when he gets there, he finds a woman who is quite ill, who has a history of tuberculosis in her family, who is quite code, like almost codependent, dependent definitely, but you know, really uh, actually looking for someone to take care of her in a way we never think of George O'Keefe as being, someone who's really needy is what we would say today, and incidentally broke because her family had lost all of its money and she had lost, she didn't have any family money to speak of left to support her. She had to teach to make a living. And so it was really quite a package for a young man like Paul Strand to take on. In addition, I think she was also demanding as an artist, an artistic personality. I think she was already a, kind of a, a bit of a diva as well. So he took a look at this, and despite her beauty and her, her, her charm, he decided he could not take on the responsibility of being the supporter and helpmate and partner of Georgia O'Keeffe. And essentially, he writes to Alfred Stieglitz and says, I can't handle her. You can have her, which, of course, sets up this problem because, of course, Stieglitz is married. And, uh, but meanwhile, George O'Keefe doesn't know that Stieglitz and Strand are comparing notes about who's going to get her or to have her. And when she finds out, she's furious, understandably furious with Strand and with Stieglitz and with the whole situation. And somehow they manage to calm her down 
the relationship with Strand is, is completely over, except as a friendship. But they, they take the train back to New York, and he sort of deposits her on Alfred Stieglitz's doorstep. And Alfred Stieglitz puts her up in this apartment with, that belongs to his, his niece and um, nurses her back to health. Now, O'Keefe is sort of lying in bed all day for days on end, and Stieglitz is visiting, bringing chicken soup or whatever, and one thing leads to another, and they become lovers. Uh, O'Keefe is a virgin at this point, and so it's her first real sexual experience, despite the fact that she'd obviously had some fooling around, as it were, with her various boyfriends before she gets to Alfred. Uh, she is really, I think, very impressed that this man, who is the most famous person in the American art world and, 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 and almost as famous in Europe, has taken an interest in her, as, and he'd already been interested in her art. And Alfred Stieglitz had been unhappy in his marriage to Emmy for many, many, many years. Uh, I don't think he'd had any sex with her for you know well over 10 years. And so he was thrilled to find this woman who was you know 24 years his junior. At this point, she's 31 and he's 54 years old. He's thrilled to find this beautiful young woman who will have him and, 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 and love him. And that begins the relationship. Artists are never appreciated when they're young. It's always when they seem to get a little more mature. Well, why? I think, why? Well, I think that in her case, it was almost a miracle that she was ever appreciated. I mean, the fact is, uh, women artists in 1905, 1906 were not given any credibility whatsoever. And even in 1916, when George O'Keeffe's drawings are shown to Alfred Stieglitz, and he says, finally, a woman on paper, and he shows a few of them in a group show and then represents her. This is an extraordinary stroke of luck. Uh, he, she was, there, were, there weren't other artists to speak of who had that kind of good fortune. A handful, maybe, uh, who would be showing here and there. Uh, but certainly, uh, the fact that she got recognized at all was extraordinary. And I think that that's even truer. I think it's very hard for artists to get the attention of anyone who will represent them and sell their work and believe in them. The end, you know, to be honest, you know, to be as uniquely talented as Georgia O'Keeffe was is not a common occurrence. She had drafting skills, an amazing color sense, and her own visual language that at the time she was starting out was unique to her. And then she never really did create a body of work that owed a debt to anyone else, which is in itself quite an accomplishment. And you don't think that's true with, uh, with other artists? I do, but other, other well-known, successful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. famous, good artists. I mean, but there aren't that many people who are able to break out their own uniquely unique language mm -hmm. of visual expression and make it theirs. Uh, you know, uh, certainly Matisse did that, Picasso did that. But, you know, there are also uh, plenty of people who are sort of owe a debt to Mickey, Matisse or owe a debt to Picasso and who work in that style but they aren't the ones who, who really created the unique visual expression of their own. Uh, there really is no f person that you can think of who George O'Keefe is that indebted to. If she's indebted to anyone, it's photography in a sort of general way. Was there any time during these 12 years that you ceased to be fascinated by her and wanted to quit this monumental project? Yes. <laughs> How many times? Yes. A lot. What huh? happened is that after I started my biography, another biography came out by Roxana Robinson in 1989, which was a quite complete, quite definitive uh, take on George O'Keefe. And it really didn't, it, it, it answered a lot of the questions all of us had had. It did not have the material about Dorothy Norman in it, uh, as I've presented. It didn't have the Paul Strand material. It didn't have a lot of what I was subsequently able to discover. But it did mean that I should just take a break and, uh, and wait to see what I could come up with that would be different and would still answer whatever remaining questions there were. The big break for me, in addition to interviewing Dorothy Norman and, and many of O'Keeffe's friends, uh, was that the catalog Raisonné was published in 1999. And that as you know, as the definitive cataloging of any artist's work, but that cataloging only, only exists for very famous artists. 
so up until then, we did not know how the, the full body of George O'Keefe's work. There were a thousand works in the catalogue raisonne that no one ever knew about that were in her studio when she died. Most of these are works on paper, watercolors, pastels, and then some oils. But having almost a thousand works to contend with gave us a much fuller picture of what George O'Keefe really accomplished in, that, in, in the course of a very lengthy career. I mean, she was really active as an artist, if we think about it, for uh, you know, six, more than 60 years. Well, not 60, probably 50, 60 years. And that, you know, she just was really, uh, it's a long career. Let's say 50 years, let's be conservative. But that's a, that's a, there were like over 2,000 works in the catalog raisonne. That was one benefit. The other benefit, most importantly, probably for a biographer, is that the dating became accurate. And suddenly we could be, I could be much clearer about what she did in each year and how she moved stylistically and how she developed uh, in that way. And it was an invaluable uh, tool for any biographer. And it also made my biography de facto the most accurate biography available because every previous account of O'Keeffe's life did not incorporate that material. So there are lots of dating problems and lots of inaccuracies and, and that's not what you want in a biography. In looking at Georgia O'Keeffe's paint chips, her paint boxes, her charcoals, all of which are on view in the Georgia O'Keeffe Research Center in Santa Fe, we see really uh, how meticulous and organized and methodical she was as a painter. That she would notate on her sketches what color went where. And then if she did, liked a certain yellow that she had created in a painting of, a pa of, of whatever, a flower or a mountain, she could find that exact yellow because she kept such detailed records of, of her painting skills. That information was never available before. So it, it was not just people that I had access to, it was also information that kind of came out of the Georgia O'Keeffe Foundation slowly doing its work to disperse what had been in Georgia O'Keeffe's estate to various agencies, the museum or the center or indeed to other museums. Were all of her influences male? Well, or were she, there some women? She said, you know, she, it's interesting, she always said that you know, there, there were no women to look at when she started painting. I mean, I suppose there was Mary Cassatt and there, were, there was Berth Morisot and some of the women impressionists, but her work is not impressionistic in any way. And I think she consciously moved away from that because of them. I think that uh, what she tried to do was create her own art Certainly there are influences from photography. There are color influences from, from the Fauve painters or like from, from Matisse, I'm sure. Uh, there are influences in, in terms of the work of Arthur Wesley Dow, the great theorist who talked to her about Japanese art and about the use of decoration and pattern and, and sequentiality in painting. All of those were very, all of that was influential, plus her work as a commercial illustrator cannot be underestimated. I mean, she did work for over a year doing illustrations and graphic art, and she learned from that and from photography how to make those very graphic compositions. Sometimes she's criticized for that ability to make such a completely graphic, uh, accessible image, but it, it certainly makes the work popular and easily, easily identifiable. So the answer is, is I don't think she really had too many women she could be influenced by. And then later in her career, in the early 30s, she says that when she made her own work, she always tried to ask herself, is this indebted to some man or a photograph of a work by some man? Or is it all of my own? And it, by being all of my own, all of woman. So she was very conscious about trying to make a work of art that was from the perspective and position of being a woman. Would you consider her an early feminist? George O'Keefe, yes, is very much an early feminist. Well unknown. I mean, there, I'm sure it was not that word at that time. Well, she was a member of the National Women's Party, mm -hmm. and she was uh, involved in the ideas behind uh, women's independence. And as she developed her own independence from Stieglitz, she talked often about how women needed to learn to support themselves financially. She read the work of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, a very, a, an early feminist writer. 
She uh, was for, you know, the vote, uh, for women getting the vote, and she was uh, for the women's the Equal Rights Amendment, and uh, wrote a rather remarkable letter to Eleanor Roosevelt in support of the Equal Rights Amendment, and uh, really uh, demanding that Eleanor Roosevelt support this. And uh, she, so she was a feminist. And she's criticized because in the 70s, when the women's movement comes into full flower, if you will, uh, she is approached by feminists asking for her support. And she doesn't give it to them because she believes it will be dam damaging to women artists if they start to see themselves and present themselves in a separate status as women. That they need to be able to do what she did, which is to com compete on, at, at, with men and be able to stand up uh, to whatever men are offering in the galleries and in the museums. And she felt very strongly that she not be identified as a woman artist. Uh, there's one interview where the reporter writes the headline that, you know, this is an interview with America's greatest woman artist. And he shows it to her and she just scratches out the word woman. She thought she was the, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. She had an artistic ego that way, she, an artist's ego rather. She believed in herself and uh, she did believe that women had to compete with every great artist who had ever existed and not in any way ghettoize themselves by exhibiting and comparing themselves only to other women. After 12 years of living and breathing the persona of O'Keefe, would you have liked her as a person? I think knowing as many people as I do who were her friends. I mean, I interviewed many people who were elderly when I interviewed them, and they, they considered themselves her friends. They would go hang out at the house in New Mexico in Abiquiu or at the Ghost Ranch. These would be uh, Margaret Kiscadden or Todd and Lucille Webb. Uh, they always reveal a side of O'Keefe that we never saw, a humorful, relaxed, charming person. I think anyone in the media, anyone in art history, a critic, people who went there on business or to interview her, they saw the grand O'Keefe, the diva, the demanding perfectionist, the woman who you know, knew she had a certain image to project and always projected it without any kind of variance. So I think if you got beyond that at some point, you got to be O'Keefe's friend, you do really enjoy her for that, in, in that way. I, uh, I never met Georgia O'Keefe. I'm just going to ask. So I, uh, I, I don't know. I'm only going by the way, by how she was valued by uh, her friends. Uh, on the other hand, she was you know, certainly a demanding friend to have, as many artists are. This book has an entirely different view of the O'Keeffe-Stiglitz relationship. It has much more information about O'Keeffe's early years and how, how difficult they were and how much she had to overcome. Uh, I just couldn't get over how lucky this woman was. You know, here she, in her autobiography, O'Keeffe presents her life as being sort of effortless and, and lovely and, and, and with no problems and, and, you know, how much she loved growing up on the farm in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. And the fact is, she grew up on the farm, but you know, her, her family then, without discussing it with her or any of her siblings, moves the entire clan to Williamsburg, Virginia, where her father is apparently unable to work, and, or at least make any money working, and slowly they lose this, this fortune they had acquired. And uh, so then, in those days, for a young woman to be an artist, it was assumed you'd have some family money to back up that idea because there wasn't exactly a job market for artists. Artists didn't teach in schools the way they do now so much where they can actually have a, make a living. So here she's forced to go out into the commercial world where she has to be a grubby little you know, illustrator, which she hates because this is not a glamorous art director position. This is, you know, grotty hand drawing, as many drawings as you can do is over, over a course of time. It's hard work. And how she overcame that, and she then went back to school and learned these new techniques. And I couldn't get over how she just never gave up. And she really wanted to be an artist, no matter what that required. And then she would have been a provincial school teacher in the West had it not been for the extraordinary stroke of luck of meeting Alfred Stieglitz and then becoming his lover. 
So she was just very lucky in, those, in, in that way. And I, I was so increasingly struck by how none of that is in the autobiography. I understand that there is interest from various production companies in Hollywood to make your book into a feature. Is that any comments? Well, we don't know if it's going to be a feature yet. I think it would be a wonderful film, and I think it, it has a story that other accounts of George O'Keefe's life don't have. I mean, the usual version of O'Keefe's life is, is, is pretty, it's like a one act where, you know, O'Keefe meets Stiglitz, they fall in love, she becomes a famous painter and, and it has a wonderful life. And mine is much more, you know, I can encapsulate it by saying it, it's passion, betrayal, redemption. You know, it has all the, all the pluses of a major motion picture. So Everything I hope that sells. Become, yes, I hope. I think it's a better story. I hope someone will make it into a movie. Writing this book has been stressful and frustrating, of course. What do you do to clean out your head? I walk the dogs. I have two standard poodles, and I get up early in the morning, and I, I take them for long walks in the, along Franklin Canyon, where we have a little lake, and you can walk around the lake, and there are ducks, and I do that. And, uh, and, that, and by the time I get back, we're all three of us, all, the two dogs and myself, we're all calm and ready to start the day's work. You said that this was your first book. Are there others on the horizon? Yes, I have a couple of book ideas, and I'm hoping that, uh, that someone will want me to do them. Did you always want to be a writer? I studied fine art. I actually went to school to be an artist, but I, uh, I, I was always a better writer than artist, and I am better at discussing what I want to do than, or talking about art than I am at actually making art. And I never really did love that much the process of actually painting or developing photographs and chemicals. I, I really felt that it was, uh, I, I just, I like the ideas behind the art and I always liked reading artist biographies. But also that explains why you became a cultural writer, I think, huh? Yes, well it was, it was, I was, I had my own stroke of luck. I was a practicing artist and I was living in Japan and I met a man named Donald Ritchie who's in the acknowledgments of my book because he, I say he started me on my way and he, asked if I wanted to write about film for the Japan Times, which is an English language newspaper in Tokyo. And I had always been a film nut, as we all are, you know, and I thought I knew a lot about film. So I said yes, and I started writing these little reviews for the Japan Times. And it was as though the minute I started writing, I thought, this is what I'm supposed to do. And Donald, I think, recognized in me that I was sort of like, like a little bit too uh, in, like intellectually inclined to be a, an artist, not that artists can't be that, but that I was much more analytical and probably was a little bit too uh, much that way to let go enough to be a, an artist. And he saw that in me and he really encouraged my writing. And he had written all the monographs on Japanese film directors like Kurosawa and Ozu and he'd written every major textbook on Japanese film and he was really a bit of an iconic character when I got to Japan. And this was a long time ago, but he was already like a, considered a cultural treasure. And he was so valued as a writer that I also got to see someone in a culture who was valued as a writer. And that was another uh, kind of role model that I needed to see. And when I came to LA, initially, I thought I would pursue film writing, but when I was here, it wasn't as interesting to me as the art scene. So I started to write about art, beginning with video art and photography, which are connected to film, and then performance art, and then one thing led to another. The next thing I knew, I was just writing about art and not writing about film at all. Hunter, thank you very much for visiting with us today. It's been fascinating. The book is brilliant, and uh, long may it wave. Thanks it's again. Good. Thank you very much. style choices, and uh, she accommodated that perception. The main character in my book, who brings a whole new dimension to the relationship of Georgia O'Keeffe, Alfred Stieglitz, and her life after Alfred Stieglitz is, of course, Dorothy Norman, who was in her 80s when I interviewed her, and who decided to go public with her relationship with Alfred Stieglitz. It had been rumored for years that 
Dorothy Norman had been Alfred Stieglitz's lover, but it, it had been equally rumored that they were just friends, and no one really knew what this relationship was. She told me about their love affair and how often they made love and how satisfying it was, and she also uh, let me read her correspondence with Alfred Stieglitz, which uh, it went from sort of the late 20s until you know the 40s when he, di he died in 1946. And I think I'm the only biographer to have read this correspondence. And what happened is that it, it made it clear to me, that correspondence made clear to me that that relationship was much Hunter, as an art critic and as an art journalist, for years you've written about the arts and artists, architects and architecture, design and designers for newspapers and magazines, and now a book. You also did a television series on the arts. Is one medium more interesting to you than another? Well, certainly writing a book is the most difficult thing to do. and, uh, and I think it probably is the most rewarding I, I, because I know it'll, I hope, I hope it'll be around for a while. Uh, with this book on Georgia O'Keeffe, I set out years and years ago to answer a lot of questions that I felt hadn't been answered. And it just took a long time to get, uh, to get those answers. But I think that of all those media, certainly it, it's rewarding because I feel like I did what I set out to do. It's, it's incredible. And that actually was a question I was going to ask. What drove you to spend over 12 years researching and writing that very large, extraordinary book? Was it because it had never been done? You admired her greatly or a combination of both? And you just said there were many questions unanswered. Well, it began back in 1987 when she died. And I wrote an obituary for Art News magazine. And in doing the research for that piece, I found that there was no big book on Georgia O'Keeffe. There was a small biography, and there were lots of magazine articles. But people tend to write about Georgia O'Keeffe then and now in a very uh, appreciative and enthusiastic way, which is fine. But it didn't feel like what had been written was getting at the meat of some of the, of the some of of, of what made her Georgia O'Keeffe. So I started out on this project, and it took all this time to, answer, to, to get to the meat, really. Uh, Georgia spent a lot of her time covering up her past and making it difficult for researchers and critics to um, understand where she'd come from. Why was more profound and long-lasting uh, than anyone had previously suspected? that really, uh, even though we always think of Georgia O'Keeffe and Alfred Stieglitz as the, as the, 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 the most passionate, loving couple of, of their period in the 1920s, uh, in fact, their relationship is only about 10 years long before he decides to have an affair with a much younger Dorothy Norman. And I really thought that had a tremendous effect on Georgia O'Keeffe on the fact that she'd had this nervous breakdown and that she moves to New Mexico. I, I think that those, those come after his, the discovery of, of Stieglitz having the affair, and I really felt that that was really tremendously interesting and important information that hadn't been in any previous book. Stieglitz and O'Keefe stay together. They never divorce. They are still married when he dies in 1946. But at the same time, Alfred Stieglitz has a relationship with Dorothy Norman from sort of 1928 to 1946. I mean, it goes on. And more devastating... Why would she do that? Well, I think being with Alfred Stieglitz, her husband, she learned the importance of being a professional artist. She learned the skill of presentation, and she learned to present herself as this kind of iconic image from him, uh, to dress in a certain way, to always be a certain kind of person when she was being Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist. Uh, meanwhile, if she was, happened to be at home, she'd probably let her hair down and cook and, and be a natural, fun-loving kind of girl. But when she was out in public, she was very grand and, um, and eccentric and uh, demanding Georgia O'Keeffe because she knew that the public expects their artists to be 
uh, something different from a mere human being. They expect them to be grander and more difficult. They expect them to have, wear funny clothes and, and have odd lifestyles.